All right, thank you. I know we're kind of late in the day. I also know what continuing education is like. These are um, long days, but a lot of important material, and DLGF has totally taken over the day, so we really appreciate all your time and, and cooperation. We've got still some more good material to cover this afternoon. We're going to talk about, um, about income taxes, and we're going to talk about um, abstracts in partnership with the, the Auditor of State's Office. How about if we start out on just a, a light note to start? Does anybody like a joke to get started since it's kind of late in the day? Anybody here hear about the banana that had to go to the doctor's office? It, it turns out he just wasn't peeling well. <laughs> he wasn't peeling well. But when he was there in the waiting room, he did see the bear who had had his teeth knocked out. Total gummy bear. Total gummy bear. Okay, now everybody's loose. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, income taxes for the next half hour or so. Uh, for, for income taxes, we're going to spend a, a good piece of, of this conversation focused on um, ordinances and templates, but I'm going to take this opportunity to um, also provide, uh, at a real summary level, an overview of local income taxes and some things that it's important um, that you all know, and also important that, uh, that county council members know, and, and in some counties that um, that city and town, uh, you know, council and board members know. So uh, local income taxes are found at um, IC 6 3.6. .6. The, the language around it changed a couple of years ago where we're no longer referring to, um, to LOITS, but instead we're referring to, to LIT, which stands for local income taxes. So broadly speaking, uh, the terms CAGIT and COIT and CEDIT uh, those terms are, are retired. We don't use them for very much any longer, um, with just a rare exception or two for either cleanup items um, or for the, the current supplemental distribution, which we'll talk about um, here in just a few minutes. But I'm going to spend a, a few just going through a broad overview of local income taxes, um, again, at a summary level. So broadly speaking, there are three different local income tax types. Um, there is expenditure or, or items that fall within the expenditure rate, uh, property tax relief, and uh, special purpose, which are, which are tax rates which are authorized specifically for county um, in statute. So the adopting body for uh, income taxes is not the same for all counties across the state. Um, in certain counties, it's going to be the county council, and in certain counties, the adopting body is going to be what's known as the local income tax council. And so the way to think about this, if you happen not to be sure, is if you're from a former Kajit county, uh, your adopting body is the county council. If you are from a former Coet county, your adopting body is the uh, local income tax council. And then if you didn't have Kajit or Coet and all you had was CEDIT, the adopting body in your county depends upon the body that established um, the CEDIT. So at the time, there was, there was sort of a race to see who decided to establish um, CEDIT if there wasn't either Kajit or Coet in place. Um, the body that established it, either the county council or the local income tax council, is now your adopting body. So for the county council, uh, I mean, the term's self-explanatory. It is the county council that serves as the body. For a local income tax council, uh, in that case, the adopting body is composed or comprised of uh, the county council and also of each of the municipal councils, um, and, and they have a share of the overall vote. Um, so more counties are uh, county council adopting body than local in income tax council adopting body, but um, there are quite a few of them out there. If you haven't adjusted um, income tax rates in the last couple of years since we did the transition from LOIT to LIT, and if you have questions about um, who is your adopting body or what are the adoption um, procedures, please reach out to our office. Um, we'll be happy to work with you on that. So um, one of the, the major types of local income tax is the, uh, the expenditure category or the expenditure rate. In counties other than Marion County, the expenditure rate is capped at 2.5%. In Marion County, it is capped at 2.75%. And the expenditure rate does have a few fundamental differences from uh, property tax relief, but, but the, the main way that I think about expenditure rate personally 
is that this is um, a pot of money that's derived from income taxes and doesn't serve as a substitute for other revenue, but instead this is additional revenue that taxing units in the county receive. So the different types of expenditure rate are uh, certified shares, uh, and certified shares includes uh, levy freeze for, for a small handful of counties around the state, uh, plus the former uh, Kajit PTRC. There's economic development, uh, public safety, and then a new one that we're going to spend a couple minutes uh, talking about just a few slides from now, and that's um, the new correctional and rehabilitational facilities option, uh, which became available to county governments uh, this year during the legislative session uh, following House Enrolled Act uh, 1263. So the type of uh, expenditure rate that a county uh, or that the adopting body chooses to impose is going to dictate who is the actual recipient of the expenditure rate dollars, and it's broken down by, by the type of rate. So uh, certified shares go to all civil taxing units, uh, county, townships, uh, municipalities, uh, libraries, uh, uh, and some, sometimes, special way, or sometimes special districts. For former Kajit counties that have, uh, have certified shares, in the same way that Kajit PTRC, a piece of that, piece of the first 0.25% um, went to school corporations, that's also the case under the current uh, lit law. So, so part of the philosophy behind the transition from low it to lit was to consolidate it down to a single set of laws, but, but not really create revenue shifts where possible. So if you are a former Kajit County, the school corporations in your county are still eligible for a piece of, uh, of the expenditure rate um, through the certified shares. Um, the, the adopting body has the option to say um, whether a solid waste management district is a recipient of certified shares money or is not a recipient, and, and we have both of those um, around the state. Economic development is spread among um, the county government and among municipalities that uh, spread among the county and municipalities. And in the same way, public safety is also spread among the county government and any municipalities that provide some sort of uh, public safety function. And then each summer or late in the summer, um, the county council or the adopting body also has the option to um, identify a few taxing units or a few non-taxing units, I should say, um, that can be recipients of of public safety money. So these may be uh, volunteer fire departments, uh, organizations of, of that type. And we have a few, a few counties around the state that choose to take advantage of that option as well. Um, so when that happens, it's a piece of the, uh, the public safety pot of money that reduces the amount of money that's gonna go to the other uh, taxing units in the county. And then finally, new for this year is this fourth option that we have listed, and that's um, correctional and rehabilitational facilities. Uh, the money from a tax imposed um, for this purpose will go exclusively to, uh, to the county government for that purpose. So again, I, I know we've done much more extensive presentations on income tax, um, and we have more detailed information available on our website. We're happy to work with you. My, my goal in this one is to keep it at, at a pretty high level. So the other uh, broad category besides expenditure rate is property tax relief. Uh, property tax relief, unlike the expenditure rate, is used to uh, serve as a substitute for a different pot of money. In this case, um, it's money that's raised through income taxes with the goal being to buy down uh, property tax bills. Uh, the, the property tax relief rate is capped at 1.25%, so it's smaller um, at its maximum level than, um, than the expenditure rate is. Each year, if you are a county that has property tax relief, um, each year you'll go through a process with the Auditor of State's office to uh, compute a property tax relief credit percentage, which will ultimately be applied against tax bills, against the gross taxes computed on tax bills. Uh, and one of the things to keep in mind for, uh, for this particular rate, and this is actually a, an important point that um, I, you know, many folks may know this, but I'm not, I'm not positive everybody does. One of the, the benefits of property tax relief to a county that chooses to impose it, assuming that the county has taxpayers that hit the circuit breakers, is um, property tax relief can be used as a tool to reduce 
circuit breaker impact uh, within a county. So it, it's a benefit to the property taxpayer at a cost of income taxes, and it can be a tool for the reduction of circuit breaker uh, if that's something that the adopting body is interested in. And we're gonna walk through uh, just a, a, an example or two that shows how that works. So this is, uh, this is a, a tax bill. This is data that could be from a tax bill. And this is for a 1% a uh, taxpayer with a very simple case. They don't have assessed value spread across buckets. They don't have, they're not in a district with referenda. This is actually um, the actual tax rate um, and an example that we could use from uh, Newcastle in, in Henry County. So um, in this case, we have a taxpayer with $100,000 gross AV, and they receive their, their standard deduction and their supplemental deduction and their mortgage deduction, bringing their um, total net assessed value down to $32,750. And the tax rate in, in Newcastle is uh, $4.35, or 4.3505 specifically which leads to a gross tax liability of $1,424.79. So if we were in a world without uh, circuit breaker, then this taxpayer would owe $1,424. Um, we do, of course, have uh, circuit breaker credits. Uh, this taxpayer, again, just a very simple case, $100,000 property. They're going to be capped at $1,000. That's 1% of the $100,000 gross AV. So they receive $424.79 in circuit breaker credits. Uh, as it turns out, Henry County, uh, the, the one spot that sort of deviates from Henry County is that, that Henry County does have uh, property tax relief. They're, they're one of the counties that's chosen to, uh, to use that income tax option. So keep in mind this $1,424.79 in gross tax liability that we compute. Well, early in the winter, um, after, after tax rates are computed, the, the auditor from any county that has property tax relief is going to work with the auditor of state's office to compute um, a property tax relief credit percentage. And in Henry County, it's, it's a, um, a pretty high percentage, 18.4623%. And what that credit percentage means is that we're going to take a taxpayer's gross tax liability multiplied by that property tax relief credit percentage to arrive at uh, property tax relief credits for the taxpayer. Um, so taking the, the $1,424.79 and multiplying it by um, a little over 18%, we arrive at $263.05 in property tax relief credits. Uh, so uh, we're going to subtract that out to get something that doesn't really have a name but just for the sake of it, uh, tax bill after property tax relief. And then if we go back to our full tax bill equation, what we're gonna see for the taxpayer is where previously our example taxpayer had $0 in property tax relief credits and $424 in circuit breaker, they now have 263 in property tax relief um, and 161 in circuit breaker. So to the taxpayer in this case, um, who's already at their circuit breaker limits, they're indifferent. It, it doesn't matter to them. The most they were ever going to pay was $1,000. Uh, but to the local governments, this is a big difference because the $263 that's listed here um, is revenue that local governments are going to receive uh, that's funded through income taxes that they wouldn't have received if the money was lost to, to circuit breaker credits. So um, we're far from being in the business of advocating for, for county income tax policy. It's 100% a local call, and we'll always respect that decision, of course. Uh, but for, for a county that's trying to evaluate an option, a, a county that's trying to figure out um, if, they, uh, if they have circuit breaker issues or taxing units with circuit breaker issues, trying to figure out if there is an answer, something that can be done, um, property tax relief is designed to provide um, relief for that type of situation. And, and there's, there's more nuances to it, too. The, the equation is not this not this simple. For instance, if a, if a taxing district has a referendum rate, the referendum rate's not going to be eligible for the property tax relief. So the, the calculation gets um, somewhat more nuanced. Um, with that said, there are a variety of options that, uh, that counties or that the adopting body has for property tax relief um, in, to, in terms of who they can provide the, the relief to. So um, the most common options that we see are the first one and the last one on this list. 
So the adopting body will choose to provide property tax relief to 1% to taxpayers. And when I say 1, 2, and 3%, we're referring to the circuit breaker categories. So those are, those are homestead taxpayers. That's a, a pretty common option. Um, and the bottom option is also a common one. Um, the, the adopting body can choose to provide property tax relief um, to all taxpayers. So that's going to hit um, homeowners, and that's going to hit ag and, and commercial and industrial and so on. Um, other options include um, providing relief to 2% to taxpayers, uh, providing relief to, to the 3% taxpayers, um, or providing relief to, um, to residential taxpayers. So the, the adoption process is uh, fairly well regulated in statute. There's a, a, a series of pretty specific steps that, um, that adopting bodies need to, to follow if they want to make changes to their income tax um, structure. So, so our agency is tasked with making uh, uniform notices, ordinances, and resolutions available for use. When the conversion from 63.5 to 63.6 first occurred a couple years ago, it was mandatory that, uh, that counties use the ordinances and resolutions prescribed by the department. Uh, that's not the case any longer. Um, we, we make them available as something that you can choose to use. Uh, many counties choose to do so. Um, you're not required to. Uh, but we released the most recent version of them um, just uh, within the last two weeks on May 11th. So you can find them on our website. Uh, the templates that we have available right now are um, templates for um, a notice of hearing on a proposed ordinance or a notice of hearing on a proposed resolution. And then we also make available uh, uniform or example um, ordinances and resolutions that can be used to modify uh, lit rates along with who the, the recipient of property tax relief is going to be in a given county. So this is, this is what the, the ordinance or one of the ordinances is going to look like. Um, this is an ordinance that a, um, that a county or that the adopting body could use to set, um, to set a new local income tax rate. And so we have it broken down with the first three being the historic um, expenditure rate categories, certified shares, public safety, and economic development. And then down on the bottom of the list, we've also added the newest one, which is correctional or rehabilitational facilities. We also have property tax relief and special purpose listed here. And our goal with this particular format is that the adopting body will list the current rates. So those rates that taxpayers are paying today and the way that it's, it's broken out among the different groups um, in the column on the left. And then the proposed rate or the new rate in the column on the right. And, and by doing so, it helps to make uh, crystal clear uh, what the adopting body's intent is uh, behind their new adoption. In the same way, if you are a county that has property tax relief and uh, wants to go through uh, the process of changing the allocation of, uh, of property tax relief among different groups of taxpayers, uh, you could, for instance, want to allocate it from all taxpayers to 1%, 1% taxpayers to all, or, or any combination of these. Um, we ask for the same thing. List your existing breakdown in the leftmost column and then the breakdown that you want to move to in, in the rightmost column. And the next slide that I'm going to pull, pull up, this is actually, um, if there was anything that I was going to highlight today, this is the one that I, I really wanted to spend the most time um, emphasizing and making sure that folks know is an option. Because I'm, I'm quite confident there are counties out there that don't realize that they have this choice. Um, 63.632 specifically gives counties or the adopting body the option to submit an ordinance to, um, to DLGF in advance of, um, of a hearing and potential adoption by the local adopting body. And the idea behind that is our agency will then uh, break it down, make sure that we understand what, what your intent is, and either give you the thumbs up or tell you that we think there are some changes that you should look into. I would absolutely encourage every county that's thinking about going through an income tax change to follow these steps. Um, notify us in advance, send us your ordinance. We would love to look at it and uh, provide you some feedback. And there are also uh, a strategic reason or two that um, you, you probably want to take this process seriously. And among them is uh, local governments or the adopting body is given a single bite at the apple when it comes to modifications to 
uh, to income tax rates. So should something go wrong with, with the ordinance or with the adoption, you run the risk that you're not actually going to be able to make the change to your income tax rate that you intended to uh, if something is missed in the process the first time around. Of course, we, we get attorneys involved and try to figure out what your, your remedies are, but um, this is something that you can do to reduce your risk uh, and, and just to, to get in front of agency hands um, so we can take a look at it in advance. Um, we also stay in regular contact with the uh, Department of Revenue. Um, you have to submit any adopted ordinances to DOR as well. We stay in contact with them. And we bounce questions off them about um, if there's anything that's not totally clear about how something's going to be um, imposed. So uh, again, I, I don't think that probably in advance every county knows this is an option. And if you only modify your, your income tax structure, your income tax rates, every few years, um, it can be easy to, to overlook changes in the process. But this is an option available to you, um, and I strongly encourage you to, to give it some consideration if you're going to be making income tax changes. After a lit ordinance is uh, adopted, local governments are required to submit it to the department in the format prescribed by, by DLGF. And, and the format that we've decided upon for that is uh, through Gateway. So where you submit it now is within the Gateway budget application. The same screen that you go to to, to submit your Form 4 or for this time of year specifically, uh, your um, excess assessed value report that your redevelopment commissions have to put together. At the same place that you submit that is where you'll submit um, income tax ordinances to us. We've got um, an automated system set up that that local governments don't see, but we as state agencies do. So when you submit that ordinance, it automatically triggers an email to um, a handful of folks from our office, from the Department of Revenue, from um, the State Budget Agency, uh, from the State Board of Accounts, and the Auditor of State, making sure that all the interested parties recognize uh, that there's been a change or there's a change that we need to be considering. And then uh, from there, our agency is tasked with um, notifying you within uh, 30 days if we've received everything that, that you are required to submit. And one thing that's important to note is um, a lit change isn't actually effective until you receive um, that feedback from our agency. And, and we're going to be quick about getting it to you. We, we certainly try not to drag our feet on that. But what this is really designed to catch is um, it is critically important that you do submit um, an ordinance once it's been adopted by uh, the local income tax adopting body. So we mentioned 1263 just a little while ago, and, and Dan mentioned 1263 this morning. Um, this bill provided, or this act provided, a new option to uh, county governments specifically related to raising money to provide for uh, correctional facilities and rehabilitational facilities. And so it sets a maximum income tax rate of 0.2%, uh, broken out in increments of 0.01%. And a rate that's adopted under, uh, under this particular income tax can't be in effect for more than a 20-year period. And so in spite of, of what I said at the beginning, where you can have different adopting bodies, sometimes the county council, sometimes the local income tax council, for this particular rate, um, the county fiscal body is always the adopting body. So the county council is going to be the one that takes action if this is something that your county chooses to do. Uh, the, the money that's raised from this particular income tax will be distributed directly to, um, to the county government. Now, there's a couple items to note, and as Dan mentioned, we're going to send out a, a slightly revised um, 1263 guidance memo sometime within the next week, two weeks. This doesn't change the overall cap on the expenditure rate, so it's still capped at 2.5%. Um, very few counties, maybe only one county are actually at the expenditure rate cap, but it is something that you're going to need to keep in mind. This doesn't give you the authority to raise more in expenditure rate than the actual cap, but if you do choose to impose this rate, it's going to sit on top of your existing expenditure um, rate. And if you use that, the, the ordinance structure that we laid out, it's going, to, it's going to help to make that really clear. If you have questions about 1263, please um, let us know. I, I know, too, I, I was speaking with um, with David uh, Bodorf this morning about this one, and he, he spent he and Ryan Hoff have spent a fair amount of time on on um, this bill and on understanding it. Um, I think they would also be a really good resource to you if uh, if you, this is something that your county is thinking about doing. So just a little bit more on local income taxes. 
Uh, just covering again some of the, the, the basics of, of things that people need to keep in mind when it comes to, to dates and the way that local income tax changes work. Uh, the 6.3.6 .6 is very structured in terms of uh, the effective date of a given tax being based upon when your organization, when your adopting body chooses to take action. So um, for an adopting body that makes a rate change, a tax rate change, in a given year, uh, up to and through August 31st, that tax, tax rate goes into effect um, on October 1st of that same year. Between September 1st and October 31st, goes into effect on uh, January 1st of the following year. And then November through uh, December 31st, that one, like adopting at the beginning of the year, takes effect the following October 1st. And you can make these changes at any time during the year. So if this is something that you're, um, your county is interested in doing, you're, you can certainly do this um, as soon as your, your June meetings, as long as you can, get, you can get notice out in time. For property tax liability changes, so, so we're thinking property tax relief in this case, um, if the adoption is done uh, between January 1st and November 1st, then the effective date is um, the following January 1st. If it's done between November 2nd and December 31st, then it takes effect of January 1st of the year that follows that one. So again, that's going to pertain to property tax relief changes. And distribution of allocation, so money that's raised um, typically through the expenditure rate, um, that's going to follow the same timeline as property tax relief changes. January 1st through November 1st um, takes effect on the following January 1st, and then November 2nd through the end of the year takes effect on January 1st in the year that follows. And if you have questions about those date changes, that's definitely something. Stay in touch with our office. We're happy to walk you through it. Uh, the final thing that I want to cover on income taxes is uh, the supplemental distribution. So uh, supplemental distribution has actually been around in uh, the local option income tax laws and the lit laws for, for years. But we went through a period where, where basically nobody qualified for a uh, supplemental distribution. And you probably remember from uh, two years ago, there was a, uh, a large distribution for um, largely for road funding that, um, that pulled money from um, from local income taxes or from the, the trust accounts. And what happened at the same time is um, the trust account balance percentage required to generate a supplemental distribution was reduced from 50% down, uh, down to 15%. Uh, and so that's a, that's a really big difference. And what that means is we're going to start seeing a lot of counties that qualify for supplemental distributions. And that, that really uh, became the case this year. So in 2017, uh, the first year that the 15% um, the 15% uh, was the actual value. Uh, we did have two counties that qualified. So, so Owen and Kosciuszko County did receive supplemental distributions last year. Uh, this year in 2018, uh, we've got 30 counties that are going to receive supplemental dist distributions. So um, we're up toward about a third of the state. Um, it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in the future, but um, it, I think there's a, there's a guess out there that that number is going to, to, if anything, increase to be even more counties in the future. So um, a timeline for, for when uh, different things happen when it comes to supplemental distributions. Um, each year by May 1st, uh, the state budget agency will provide to, um, to counties and then also to the Department of Local Government Finance uh, a total amount of supplemental distribution money available at a county level. Um, and so budget agency did do that this year um, just before May 1st. Uh, our task two weeks later is to provide a breakdown by taxing unit, which we did. And then we released an additional breakout just a couple of days later um, that pertained to some of the old LOIT buckets, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And then your task um, by May 30th are, is to distribute that money to, um, to the local taxing units in your county. Um, so you're going to receive the money from the Auditor of State, and then by the end of the month, um, you provide that money to the taxing units based upon the distribution amounts that the Department of Local Government Finance calculates. So uh, the, the amount that's going to be distributed to taxing units is based upon uh, the trust account balance year. And the trust account balance year is always two years before the current year. So um, in 2018, it's based upon 1231-16. Uh, 1231-16 uh, was the last day that we were under uh, LOIT as opposed to LIT. So for this supplemental distribution, 
that uh, you may have seen if you're one of the counties that, that has a supplemental, you'll notice that it's broken out into um, the old local option income tax categories as opposed to the local income tax categories. And that's a function of um, the trust account balance here being 1231.16. After this year, uh, that will no longer be the case um, and it will always be based upon, uh, based upon local income tax amounts. Um, so again, this, this slide just states the same thing. 2018 supplemental is based on the low it amounts, 2019, and every year moving forward until the income tax laws change, um, it'll be based upon um, lit configurations. We have those amounts posted on our, our website. The, the link that's here um, goes directly to, um, to the memos page on, on our website. Um, and you're always welcome to reach out to us, uh, either to Fred or to me, if you have questions about um, supplemental distributions or, or the calculations. And if you have questions that are beyond that, we're still happy to point you in the right direction, whether it's Board of Accounts or Budget Agency. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to um, transition topics and take us to the last one for the day. So we're going to um, move on from income taxes and instead talk about um, abstracts. And I'm going um, to switch the order around just a little bit. So this presentation is in partnership with, with Bob, who's right here, Bob Reynolds. If you haven't met Bob, he's the, the new local government division director at the Auditor of State's office. Um, we work um, very closely together. Um, what I'm going to do is switch this, and, and we're going to go to slide, if you, have, if you happen to have the slides printed out, um, we're going to go to slide nine and, and start there uh, and cover all things gateway abstract related, and then we're going to transition back, and Bob's going to cover um, some material on the Excel abstract.